And I believe I'm here with a purpose. Listen, last night I arrived home at 1 a.m. after a long trip since Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday I woke up at 4 a.m., went to bed at 1. Thursday I woke up at 6.30, went to bed at 1. Friday I woke up at 6.30, went to bed at 1. Yesterday I woke up at 6.30, went to bed at 1. And I'm full of energy. <laughs> and I believe I'm here with a purpose with a mission, it is to remind you that you were created with a purpose, that God knows you by name, that he knows you, your needs, and it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to stop complaining about trials and tribulations, because that's what we're meant to live for. Not, not, not to complain, but to show the world that despite the circumstances, we live with hope, Amen. and we live with a purpose. And so today, we just have a standalone message. It's called DNA. It is the core of the local church, and, and, and I don't want to get technical. I, I'm not a biologist, but DNA, many of you know of DNA. If you went to college, you probably learned about DNA. Some of you don't remember because it's been a while, um, and I'm not you know, pointing fingers or anything. I, I didn't pay attention in that class, so I just trusted Wikipedia to remind me what DNA is. And I'm not even going to try to pronounce the word. I'm just going to stick to DNA. You can Google it and try it on your own later. But it's a molecule, right? Uh, DNA, it's, it's, it's composed of, of two chains and, and the coil around it, uh, each other um, to form a, like a, a double, you know, thingy, you know, that just spins around. But what's fascinating is that the DNA carries genetic instructions used in the growth, in the development, in the functioning. And the reproduction or reproduction of all known living organisms and many viruses. I think I've mentioned this a few weeks back, but I was watching some guys that are in ro robotics trying to compete to see who can make a, the best robot that can take the place of a human in situations of danger. And they were trying, like they compete to see who can make a robot that can go up the stairs, right? And you would think that with all the technology we have, they would be able to do that. But once you watch it in real life, I, I didn't see one robot make it to the top of the staircase on its own. The goal was if there's a, a, a situation where there is a fire, instead of sending a human to rescue someone, why risk a life? We send a robot, right? Uh, and, and they're not able to do that. DNA, at the core of our human bodies, there is information that contains everything needed to make you who you are. And to think that in the mind of God, you were, even before you were born or conceived, like you are in God's mind even before you existed. And he placed a DNA. And I believe that as a church, we also have a DNA. The core of information that keeps us together, that holds us together. See, the church of Jesus Christ is the representation of God on earth in our days. Right? If you read Hebrews, it says that in the old days, in the Old Testament, God spoke to their ancestors through prophets. Right? But in these days, now he speaks through the Son, through Jesus Christ. And Jesus, before he left, he said, it's before that I, it's better for you that I leave so I can send the Holy Spirit. We were say, saying right now, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. The Holy Spirit is God himself. It's a person. It's not a thing. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's a person. It's God himself within you. And so when we come together as living stones, Scripture says, we make up the body on this earth and we're different pieces right and some of you have certain gifts and certain talents and together we complement each other and as the gathering I'm bringing it locally as the gathering we have called with a purpose and I believe that we have a DNA within us that dictates how we look how we are how we behave as a church I believe that we have been called to when a certain group of people in Midland, Texas, did you know that more than 80,000 are not in church today? That don't know anything about Jesus, that don't care about God. More than 80,000 in this little town. 
Yes, we may have big churches, a lot of churches, a lot of churches. But there are a lot of lost people. And in God's idea, in God's plan, you play a big part to reach a world that is lost. In this room, there are many of you that God found you, that God pursued you. And I guarantee you that it was not an angel that showed up at your doorstep and just started talking to you. It was probably another person anointed by the Holy Spirit to tell you, hey, you need Jesus. Hey, come to church. Hey, let me bless you. Hey, let me give you something. Can I pray for you? Do you have a need? And somehow you found God because God used another living stone. And so as the gathering, we have a DNA. What's fascinating about DNA in the human body is that each person has about 60 trillion feet or around 10 billion miles of DNA, of information. To give you a better perspective, the earth is about 93 million miles away from the sun. So your DNA, just one of us, your DNA could stretch to the sun and back to the sun and back 61 times. That's one person's DNA. And when I think about the DNA of the local body, of the church of Jesus Christ, I wonder what is it that is keeping us together? Why is it that despite the criticism around, why is it that despite the, the, the judgment on social media against the church of Jesus Christ, the church is still doing pretty good? Of course, there are bad things happening, but overall, the church of Jesus Christ has not been able to be destroyed by anybody. They haven't been able to stop the Bible. They haven't been able to stop the Word of God. They, they can't stop people from finding hope in Jesus Christ. They can't stop people from finding grace in Jesus Christ, finding mercy, finding love, finding restoration. They can't explain how it is possible for some people that the moment they come to Christ, their addictions are gone. gone. They can't explain, medically speaking, how some have been healed in a, in a miraculous way because the Word of God is effective, it's real, it's alive, it's changing lives. But I wonder what is it that is going to keep us together? Let's talk about the gathering for a moment. This church has been here since 1954. It has had good days, bad days, better days, not so good days. But I believe that we are on our best days and the best things are still yet ahead of us. And as I pray, I'm like, God, give me a strategy. No, I don't need a strategy. God, give me a plan. No, I don't need a plan. God, you know what I find out? We just need to live with purpose. We just need to live with purpose. Like we are on a mission. But there's an enemy that is going to try to stop us. So what is it that is going to keep us together? Because you would be amazed that even in church there is conflict. Even in church there is differences. Even in church there are envies sometimes did you know that sometimes in churches like really in churches some people sometimes gossip yeah don't tell anybody <laughs> but I want to point us in the direction that I believe God is leading us as a church because if we keep the main thing the main thing nothing will stop make us stumble and of course, at the center is Jesus. At the center is Jesus, the cross, and the resurrection, right? Because he is the giver of life. At the core is Jesus Christ. But, but, but I want to be more specific. What's our DNA? And there are just three things, and then I'll keep going. But I believe these three things, if we do these three things well, nothing will make us stumble. Because Jesus is at the center of all these things. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The creator of the universe says, if you follow my plan, you have 100% chances of succeeding. How many of you like to win, right? Amen. I've been playing chess with my son. He's 10 years old. He says, Dad, I want to play chess. I said, I don't know how to play chess. So let me ask Kellen because he knows everything. Or at least he acts like he knows everything. So <laughs> I texted him, Kellen, do you, do you know how to play chess? Well, I get the hang of it. But I can get it. next day I had a chess set on my, on my desk in my office. So like, dang, and now I have to learn to play chess. <laughs> so I got home. I opened the computer. I said, let's Google how to play chess. 
10 minute video by the minute number five, my son says, ah, just stop it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> so we start playing and I start beating him. I'm so excited about beating a 10 year old at chess. <laughs> See, I never cared about chess. I don't know why I'm telling this story, you guys. We all like to win, right? Like, I don't know anybody that wakes up one morning and is like, eh, today, I, want, I just want to fail everything I do today. Like, <laughs> and God says, with me on your side, you'll make it. Pastors, pastors struggle with what to do, what not to do, what to say, what not to say. And I'm like, okay, you know what I do? God, it's your church. Not that I don't care. You put me there for the reason, but... If I work in agreement with you, we'll be fine. So the gathering is all about God, community, and purpose. God, community, and purpose. And I believe that if we keep these three being the main thing on everything we do, we need the three. See, you cannot, you, you cannot say, well, it's just between me and God. God is all I need. No, you need community. You cannot say, well, I'm serving God. I don't read my Bible that much. I don't pray that much. But I'm a church. I give a church. I serve a church. No, you need God, right? Amen. And you cannot say, well, I go to church and I pray when I can. But when I go to work, I'm a different person. You need purpose. If you're not winning people for Christ, if you're not witnessing If you're not telling others about the love of God because you yourself are not experiencing the love of God when you're out there, you get off track. You need the three. And so as the gathering, everything we do has the three things in mind. This morning, we changed things up for some of you that show up early. And we close the doors and the whole purpose is to keep you there to build community around our church. God. Why God? We create a, a space to experience God, right? God. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Who loved the world? God. God. Without God, we can't do anything. Hebrews 1.1, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors. Who spoke? God. Who has been chasing us since the day we were born? God with his grace. God with his love. Hebrews 1 verse 2 says, But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, Whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. God has been involved since the beginning. God. We need God. It's all about God. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the cross. It's all about the resurrection. It's all about the Holy Spirit coming and empowering believers to be who God had in mind that they were supposed to be. Second thing is community. Community. We need fellowship with other believers. We need accountability. We need a friend that can tell us, hey, I think you're doing this wrong. We need friends that can cheer us up and say, hey, man, you're doing great. I, I, I want to pray with you and for you. I celebrate your success too. I may not be where you are. I may not have what you have, but I celebrate with you. Encouragement. Exhortation. We need the fellowship to know that we're not alone in this world, right? In this journey called faith. That we're not the only ones struggling with temptation or addiction or sickness or sadness or depression. We are so good at hiding things in our days. Jesus came. Jesus was the manifestation of God on planet earth. Jesus, God, himself, God became flesh, right? In John, it says that he became flesh and that he dwelt among us. God. God is spirit. He's at all places, at all times. See, he has been there since the beginning. And Jesus has been there since the beginning. He became flesh. Jesus became flesh. And he came with a purpose. 
He came to die. He came to give his life as a ransom for many, right? Because God so loved the world that he gave his son. He came to die so that our sins could be forgiven. And when he's living on this earth with his followers, with his disciples, he, 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 he gets to the point where it's the, the time is getting close for him to go to the cross. And he says, listen, in a little bit, in John 16, says, in a little bit, you, you will see me no more. I'll be gone. He says, but you will see me again. I will return. I will come back. Like, you won't see me for a while, but then you will see me again. He says, your grief will turn to joy. And then he warns them, you will be scattered for my sake. He says, in fact, you will leave me alone when they come and get me. You will scatter. <coughs> but Jesus says, but I am not. Alone, because my Father is with me. See, the reason we need community is that in the Trinity, we find the perfect community. That's why God is God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They work in agreement. There are three persons, one God, but they have a community that cannot be broken. They a love for one another that cannot be broken. Love holds them together. And Jesus keeps on saying in chapter 16, says, I have told you all these things, that you will be scattered, that you will leave me alone, that you will face opposition, that you will face temptation, that it will be hard to follow after me even after I leave and after I send the Holy Spirit. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Right? So that in me you will have hope. Because he says, in this world you will have trouble. In this world, you will face opposition. It will, if I am being persecuted, you will be persecuted. Thank you so much. And then Jesus says, but take heart. Because I have overcome the world. And then what is fascinating is that Jesus begins to pray for his disciples. Jesus, the son of God, prays for his disciples. And you know what the prayer is about? Any guesses? He prays for unity. He prays for unity. <laughs> He prays for unity. What happens when we come together as a community with a common purpose? When we care for one another? What is not just superficial, but it's like, I really care about you. You are family. Dave said, we are family. We are family. John 17, 20 says, my prayer is not for them alone. Not just the ones that are here. Follow me. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Jesus was praying for you and me. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that incredible that God, the God of the universe, who became flesh, thought about you 2,000 years ago? And then he says, I pray that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me, I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me. That they may be one as we are one. I in them, you in me, so that they may be brought to complete what? Say it louder. To complete. Unity. <laughs> Gotta tell you, it's not an easy road. Just like any relationship is not easy, right? Every time we come in agreement with other people, things can get complicated. There's conflict to overcome. That's why marriage is important too. Marriage is the, the greatest reflection of what it means to love God with everything. Verse 23, I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them. Even as you have loved me. 
The third thing, purpose. Purpose. We need to talk about purpose. We talk about God. We talk about community. We talk about purpose. 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 What does that mean? What does it mean to live with purpose? Friday. What day is today? Is Sunday. I was going to say, what day is today? <laughs> Friday, I preached with, 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 a, with a youth group. And I was telling them that the calling is to follow after Jesus. And we're always thinking that the calling is the thing that we have to do for Jesus. And so we say things like, well, I'm not sure what God is calling me to do. Well, I'm trying to figure out my purpose. Well, I'm trying to figure out what career, what path, what ministry. And I said, your calling is to follow. Your calling is to bend on your knees every day and follow after him. Your calling is to glorify him where you are. You don't know what your giftedness is at. Start doing whatever is in your hands. Start serving. Start honoring. Start working with everything within you to glorify God. You don't have to wait for your specific calling. You work yourself into your calling. So Ephesians 2.10, for example, says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Like what you're called to do is already waiting for you. You just have to do what you know you have to do right now. If you know 10 things about God, and you can do anything with those 10 things because you're waiting for the 20th thing that implies more information, then, then you'll never get there. You have to start with the few things that you already know. What you know about God today is enough to live for God's glory today. John 20, 21 says, again, Jesus said, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me. I am sending you. Purpose. I am sending you. Purpose. James 2, 26 says, The body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. See, the, the life of faith is more than a feeling, is more than an experience, is more than a spiritual thing in the sense of, of being a mystic. The life of faith is real life, is, is, is living with passion on everything you do. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Hallelujah, I'm waiting for lunch today. For the glory of God, right? We're on a mission. We're living with purpose. And all these things can only be accomplished through unity. What is it that keeps us together? What's the secret to find unity? What's the secret to come together as a church and be united with one purpose? I believe the secret of unity is integrity. I believe the secret of unity is integrity. Track down any division that you may know of. Track down any differences or any families that are broken. And you are going to find somewhere along the way a lack of integrity. Always. Always. Or a hurt. Or a scar. Or unforgiveness. There is a lack of integrity that messes up the unity that God is calling us to live for. In marriage. If you want to be united, there has to be integrity. The secret of unity is integrity. The secret of integrity is conviction. Now conviction, immediately in our minds, we, we think about conviction as judgment. That's not what conviction of the Holy Spirit means. All that, con the, the, that it means, when we say the conviction of the Holy Spirit, it, it, it use this word, the convincing of the Holy Spirit. You let the Holy Spirit convince you of the about the truth of the condition of your soul. In other words, the Holy Spirit comes in and it makes you feel like, man, I, I, think, I think I have a little bit of unforgiveness. Am I sure? Well, I don't know. Let me, let me read Scripture. And Scripture says, uh, if, if you don't forgive and, and, and you start reading, you know, about forgiveness and love, forgiveness and love and bitterness. And, and, and God starts dealing with you and, until the Holy Spirit convinces you that there's something wrong within you. And what you have to do is repent, right? Because conviction will always demand a response. Now, here's where we get stuck. 
Many of us know what our issue is, but we respond not the way that God is calling us to respond, like. In other words, you can either respond God's way or your way. And I guarantee you that his way is better because he already prepared that road for you to walk on. But if you keep walking on your own thing, doing your own thing, you're going to mess up what he's trying to do in your life and work for your life. And you get outside of his plan. And so as the church, we want to remain in unity. We want to have an integrity from the top leadership to the bottom to the volunteers. We will not accept gossip and negativity. Because we believe that God deserves the best. Amen. Because we believe that God is glorious, that he's holy, that it is his church. Unity, integrity, conviction, and a response. Now let's bring it to a personal level. How can we accomplish all these things? Because the truth is that we're humans, right? And we struggle with certain things and we are pursuing and some of us are pursuing. Some of us are about to give up. But I want to remind you that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That God knows you by name. That he knows your scars. He knows about your fears. He knows about your insecurities. He knows your pain. He loves you. God fashioned you together. He put the DNA inside of you. He formed you. He created you. He knows every single thing about you. Even the things that you try to hide or that I try to hide. And scripture says that for those who are willing to trust him. He will hold them in the palm of his hand. Scripture says that he will carry them all the days of their life. What a promise, right? You don't have to live with fear, with uncertainty, with insecurity. Because even in the midst of the trial, of the tribulation, you know that God has a plan. And if you're trusting him, you are in his hand. God loves you. God, the creator of all things, promises to hold me in the palm of his hand. Psalm 33, read a few verses, super quick. From heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. And he forms, he who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for the deliverance. Despite all his great strength, it cannot save. Your savings account cannot save you. Your work cannot save you. Your big house cannot save you. I'm not saying all those things are wrong. I'm just saying those are just additions that follow those that trust in God as their Savior. Verse 18. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear Him. On those whose hope is in His unfailing love. To deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice. For we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us. Lord, even as we put our hope in you. So God promises to hold us together. It's a personal promise and it's a corporate promise. As a church, he promises to build his church, to bring us together. We just have to get rid of sin and unfaithfulness and seek integrity and be united and live with a purpose, right? Live on mission as a church. And so if God promises to hold us together, no matter what, the question is, how do we know that this is true? How do we know that it is true that he knows me by name and I I was reminded as I was preparing, I'm, I'm about to close with this story. A, a few years back, uh, Lou Giglio, and maybe you have seen this before, but if you haven't, this is fascinating. And if you Google, you're going to find all the negative criticism about it. I don't care. I just see a support to God's scripture, to God's word about his love for us. But he tells the story that he was finishing a conference and then 
a person approaching him and said, hey, started, you know, having a conversation with him. And somehow the, this, this person asked uh, Giglio about his next sermon and, and Giglio started sharing the message. And the person says, hey, listen, I am a biologist and I have some great information that could be used because uh, wh what's your punchline in, 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 in your sermon? Wh how are you going to hit them hard at the end? How are you going to find a, a way to make your point appealing to them? Because I have a great idea and it matches what you're going to preach. And the guy started saying, listen, I am a biologist and, 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 and have you heard about cells and DNA and all that kind of thing? And, and Luke, yeah, great. I mean, awesome. I think I'm going to, you know, preach about the cell and it's going to cause revival and, you know, whatever. It starts making fun of it. But the guy kept talking and says, cells organized into a certain, you know, molecular structure. And they come together, and, and, and depending on how they gather together, they form different proteins in the body, in the human body. And, and there are between 10,000 or 60,000 proteins in reality. We don't even know how many we have in the body. But one of them is kind of like a, a cell glue, glueish type of cell that is in the body, that it organizes in a certain way, and it forms a certain structure, and it tells the cell, what its job in the body is. Bottom line is all to make the story short because I'm not biologist. <laughs> this tiny cell is what holds your membranes together. It is what keeps, you know, every organ in your body together. It, it ties things together, right? It holds you together. It is the glue of the human body. And so he says, great, I'll tell everybody about it, and revival will happen, right? He says, no, 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 no. He says, you don't understand. You don't understand what I'm trying to You have to see it. You have to see it. When you get home, go and see it. <coughs> and so he says he got home, and he Googled it, and I'm making the story long to keep you, you know, awake. <laughs> he says, so I Googled it. And when I saw on the screen the diagram of this cell that holds the human body together, I was shocked. Did I load the image? Show it now. <laughs> yeah. Laminin, I think. Something like that. What a coincidence, right? It's what's holding you together. It's what's keeping you alive. Now he thought, well, this is just a diagram. What, what if I look at a microscopic image of the same cell? And this is what we found. Whether you believe that he saves or not, it is because of his mercy that you're still alive. And time is running out. Whether you are living with the purpose or not, it is the cross, the resurrection that is keeping you alive. And the longer it takes for you to find that purpose, to redirect your life to living in God's purpose, the more time you will waste Chasing something that you will never find elsewhere, but only at the feet of Jesus. Colossians 1.15 says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. Now watch verse 17. He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. At the center of everything we do as a church is Jesus. The cross and the resurrection. He is the giver of life. If we have gotten some things wrong as a church along the way, we are still standing because of the cross. But I want to stop getting things wrong and I want to make things right corporately as a church. 
We're going to fight for integrity. We're going to fight for unity. We're going to fight for God's presence. We're going to chase his presence in everything we do. And we're going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to be light in this world. Outside of these four walls, you have what it takes to be an example to your friends at school, to your friends at work, to your family around you that don't believe in Jesus, to those that mock you. You have been given every single thing you have to be light. God is in you. The Holy Spirit is within you. And it's time to live without fear. And whether this molecule looks like it or not, Jesus is still the one holding us together. The cross is what brought us together in unity with God himself because sin separated us from him. God, community, and purpose is in our DNA. God has called us to do great things. I believe it. Not to stand out, but to glorify the Father. It is unbelievable to me that the God of the universe has no other plan before his return but the church to save the lost, to heal the brokenhearted, to provide for the needy, to change communities, to change uh, society, to change the world. He has no other plan but his church. And if you believe in Jesus Christ, you are called to be part of of the church. Amen. Amen. Father God, this morning, we give you glory and we give you honor. We give you praise. We glorify you, Lord. I pray that you bring us together, that you unite us, that you give us a purpose, that you give us a hope, that you give us a strength. Father, I know, Lord, because I've been there, Lord. I, I'm there every now and then, Lord, where I feel tired and weary and exhausted, Lord. And, Lord, I pray that if anyone here this morning is feeling that way today, that they may be reminded, Lord, that you know them, that you created them, that they have been fearfully and wonderfully made, that the cross gives them hope, that the cross gives us hope. Because of the resurrection. God, I pray that you empower us as the gathering, Lord, to do mighty things in your name. That we will not be afraid, Lord, of taking steps, radical steps that may look crazy, Lord. But in your name, Lord, we will walk on the path that you have called us to walk on. Lord, if anyone here, Lord, is in need today, would you answer? Would you provide? Would you heal? Would you deliver? Would you strengthen in Christ's name? Now, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you say, I want that Jesus that can give me purpose. This is your opportunity. And the prayer that we're about to make is not what saves you. It's what has happened in your heart. That you have decided to trust Jesus with all your life. With all your heart. With everything you do. So I'm going to invite you to pray with me. And the church will pray with you. And just say, Lord Jesus. Forgive my sins. I know I need you. I want to live for you. Help me to follow you. Heal me. Save me. Restore me. Give me the strength. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can you give God praise this morning? Would you stand up and say with